Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about stress, trauma stress related disorders. <clears throat> um, so in our field, it's been understood that exposure to traumatic event causes some individuals to display abnormal thoughts and behaviors um, that we refer today as a mental disorder. And trauma and stress related disorders are serious psychological reactions that develop in some individuals following exposure to a traumatic <clears throat> or stress stressful event such as childhood neglect, childhood physical, sexual abuse, combat, physical assault, sexual assault, natural disaster, and accident or torture. And then on the left here, we have all the disorders that are listed under the um, trauma and stress-related disorders on the DSM-5, which are reactive attachment disorder, disinhibited social engagement disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress disorder, adjustment disorder, other specified trauma and stressor-related disorder, and unspecified trauma and stressor-related disorder. So the first one we're gonna go on is um, reactive attachment disorder. And I wanna start off with uh, Erickson's stages of psychosocial development where he um, touches on basic trust versus mistrust. So infants are helpless and dependent on caregivers and parents. If needs are met consistently, the child learns to trust others and form the foundation of a secure attachment is placed. If, if needs are not met consistently, the child becomes fearful and learns to not trust or rely on others. Uh, reactive attachment disorder may be commonly misdiagnosed as mood or bipolar disorder or conduct disorder, as at risk for develop serious developmental problems such as low self-esteem, unable to develop and maintain friendships, alienated from the op and oppositional with parents or others, difficulty with genuine trust, intimacy, and affection. So what place is a child at RAD? Uh, parental caregiver contributions, child contributions, and environmental contributions. Um, and this is very, we see this, it's very prevalent in, in foster children because they're the fluctuation in primary givers and homes. Um, so it, it doesn't, it hinders them from, um, building or forming meaningful or stable uh, attachments to their caregivers. Um, it's apparent before the age of five and child must have a developmental age of at least nine months. So the next one we're gonna go to, or um, we're gonna touch on is the attachment cycle in the first year. So for a child, their a healthy first year attachment is um, the cycle is, so the infant has needs, the infant communicates the needs, the caregiver parent takes initiative to meet the needs, child has satisfaction, relaxation, and tr trust and confidence develops. For an unhealthy first year attachment cycle on a child, uh, the way that looks is the infant has a need, infant communicates needs, <clears throat> caregiver or parent fails to meet the needs, so the child develops fear and apathy, starts to feel anxiety and stress, and then leads to distress of adults, which leads to rage, sense, no sense of predictability, predictability I'm sorry, um, and no sense of safety or value. The next disorder we're gonna get into is disinhibited social engagement disorder. So like reactive attachment disorder, disinhibited social engagement disorder, is a childhood attachment disorder characterized by lack of fear towards adult strangers, little to no hesitation around strangers and acting without permission of parents or primary caregivers. DSED affects the child's ability to relate to social norms with, which affect their ability to function in the environment. If a child has a medical challenge or a unique temperament that also affects caregiving and bonding, Parents who are abused themselves don't connect with connect and bond with their children, which leads to neglect and or abuse of the child. <clears throat> children develop bonds through play by inviting the primary caregiver or givers of the child to bond with them through interactive play. Again, we see this in um, 
we see this a lot in foster care homes. Um, you know, raising children in unusual settings that's a really limit opportunities to build selective attachment. Um, repeated changes in primary givers that limit opportunities to form stable attachments. <clears throat> uh, social neglect or deprivation in the form of persistent lack of having basic emotional needs for comfort, stimulate stimulation, and affection meant by caregiving adults. And the next one we're going to go into is post traumatic stress disorder. Um, so this one's a really big one, as you've probably already seen in your DSM-5. Um, so I <clears throat> put all the clusters on the right and a little bit of the behaviors on the, on the, on the left. So um, PTSD occurs in 5 to 10% of the population and is twice as common in women as in men. Although trauma exposure is the precipitating event for PTSD to develop, biological and psycho psychosocial risk factors are increasingly viewed as predictors of symptom onset, severity, and chronicity. PTSD affects multiple biological systems, such as brain circuitry, neurochemistry, and cell, immune, and endocrine and metabolic function. Symptoms usually begin within three months of traumatic, traumatic incident, but sometimes emerge later. To meet the criteria for PTSD, symptoms must last longer than one month and must be severe enough to interfere with aspects of daily life, such as relationships or work. The symptoms also must be unrelated to medication, substance use, or other illness. The course of symptoms vary. Some people can recover within six months. Other experience symptoms that last for, longer, for a year or longer. And people with PTSD often have co-occurring conditions such as depression, substance use, and or one or more anxiety disorders. The presence of intrusion symptoms associated with the traumatic event are recurrent involuntary intrusive memories, dreams, and disassociative reactions like flashbacks, intense physiological and psychological distress in response to cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the traumatic event, persistent avoidance of stimuli associated with the trauma, negative alterations in cognitions and mood associated with the traumatic events. So an example is inability to recall an important aspect of the trauma, markedly diminished interest or participation in significant activities, feeling of detachment from others, marked alterations of arousal and, and reactivity evidenced by two or more of the following, so difficulty falling or staying asleep, reckless or self-destructive behavior, irritability, difficulty concentrating, hypervigilance, exaggerated startle response. Treatment approaches involve combination of medications and psychotherapy. So um, I named the cluster. So for cluster A, we have the traumatic exposure. Cluster B, we have the intrusion symptoms. Cluster C is the avoidance symptoms. Cluster D is the negative al alterations, sorry, in cognitions and moods. Cluster E is alterations in arousal and reactivity. Cluster F is duration. Cluster G is clinic, clinically significant distress or impairment. And cluster H is due to, not due to other causes. Then we have acute, dis, acute stress disorder. So ASD requires a precursor event in which the person experienced an event or events that involved a threat of death, actual or threatened serious injury, or actual or threatened physical or sexual violation, witness an event or events that involved the actual or threatened death, serious injury, or physical or sexual violations of others, learned of such harm coming to a close friend or relative, experience repeated or extreme exposure to adversive details of a natural death, serious injury, or serious assault or sexual violation of others that were not limited to electronic media, television, or video games. Other causes include, and these are the symptoms, flashbacks, nightmares, intrusive memories, sleep disturbances, anxiety, poor concentration, disassociative, avoidance, negative mood, arousal, so startle response, Treatments typically consist of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness therapy, or medications, or a combination of either or. 
So I want to talk about the differences between PTSD and ASD. They sound very similar, kind of overlapping one another. <clears throat> so the onset for PTSD is at least one month after the trauma occurs. With ASD, it's zero to 28 days after the trauma occurs. Um, the duration for PTSD lasts at least one month and can persist for several years. For ASD, it lasts between three days and four weeks. Symptoms under PTSD are avoidance, heightened awareness, and changes in mood or cognition. For ASD is depersonalization and derealization. For treatment for PTSD, and we kind of already talked about it, was long-term psychotherapy, medication, and EMDR therapy. Uh, for ASD is short-term psychotherapy and antidepressant medication. <clears throat> So adjustment disorders. Adjustment disorders are stress-related conditions. You experience more stress than would normally be expected in response to a stressful or unexpected, or unexpected event. And the stress cause, causes significant problems in your relationship at work or school. Work problems, going away to school, an illness, the death of a close loved one, family or friend, or any life changes can cause stress. Most of the time, people adjust to changes within a few months. But if you have an adjustment disorder, you continue to have emotional or behavioral reactions that contribute to feeling anxious or depressed. Signs and symptoms depend on the type of adjustment disorder and can vary from person to person. The individual experiences more stress than would normally be expected in response to a stressful event and the stress causes significant problems in the person's life. Adjustment disorders affect how you feel and think about yourself and the world. It may also affect your action or behaviors. Examples of this include feeling sad, hopeless, or not enjoying the things you used to enjoy, frequent crying, worrying, or feeling anxious, nervous, jittery, or stressed out, trouble sleeping, lack of appetite, difficulty concentrating, feeling overwhelmed, difficulty functioning in daily activities, withdrawing from social support, avoiding responsibilities such as going to work or paying bills, suicidal thoughts or behavior. Symptoms of adjustment disorder start within three months of a stressful event and last no longer than six months after the stressful event. However, persistent or chronic adjustment disorder can continue for more than six months, especially if the stressor is ongoing. Uh, so an example of that would be uh, unemployment or difficulty finding employment. Um, does not meet the criteria for another mental disorder. Symptoms do not represent normal bereavement. And once stress, stress, stressor has dispersed, the symptoms do not persist longer than six months. Um, another, another category that can fit into this adjustment disorders is uh, breakups, um, divorces, um, custody battles, um, anything that's not going to last longer than six months, essentially, but those are kind of some, some examples to go off of the <clears throat> adjustment disorder. Um, the next one we have is other specified trauma and stress-related disorder. So this, this is straight out of the DSM-5 because it's such a short um, specification of, of the symptoms. So symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in functioning, but full criteria for another disorder in this category is not met. So examples include adjustment disorder with delay onset, so three months after the stressor. Adjustment disorder lasts more than six months without the prolonged duration of the stressor or conditions or persistent complex bereavement disorder. Um, these are essentially, these are kind of the, the, the diagnosis that I'm, I'm giving my clients because um, it's either that or the adjustment disorders because typically they're coming in very dysregulated. Um, often, more often than not, it's because something significant happened in their life, whether it was a breakup or a, uh, grief. Um, and so they exhaust their support group and then they find professional help. And so typically these clients come in a couple of months, never really to a year. 
Um, and, and that's that's one of example of other specified trauma stress-related disorder or adjustment disorders. Um, so this category pertains to presentations in which those characteristics of trauma and stressor-related disorder that produce clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, and other important areas of functioning. And I kind of just kind of already said all of this, but <laughs> just to kind of um, go in a little deeper, but um, the next one we have is unspecified trauma and stressor-related disorder. So this category applies to presentations in which symptoms characteristic of a trauma and stressor-related disorder that cause clin clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, and other important areas of functioning predominant, but not but do not meet the full criteria for any other disorders and trauma and stressor-related disorders diagnostic class. Uh, the unspecified trauma or stressor-related disorder category, category is used in situations in which the clinician chooses not to specify the reason that the criteria are not met for the specific trauma and stressor-related disorder and includes presentations in which there's insu insufficient information to make a more specific diagnosis. So you see this a lot in emergency room settings. So again, kind of like I just touched on this a little earlier is that these are the, these are the diagnosis that you're going to be... Um, I mean, for, for me at least, but you know, don't be surprised if you find yourself not being able to give someone a full um, diagnosis of PTSD or reactive attachment if it's more of a situational thing. Um, very, very um, prevalent with people that are, they've lost something. Um, so just be on the lookout for that. Also too, when, when we talk about diagnosing um, be very mindful when, when you're diagnosing in the sense of, um, all the information you can get, right. And, and you're seeing this right now with, with the vignettes that you're getting is, you know, I know it's, it's, it's innate in us, especially as, you know, starting therapists to want to just go in and, and do something, the do something syndrome is what they call it is we want to just give some diagnostic and then go in with the treatment plan. But Keep in mind that we have to gather as much as information as we can, meaning, you know, how long has this been happening? Um, has something like this similar happened in the past to you? Have you been a uh, witness to something like this happening? Um, you know, we want to gather as much as information as we can, because otherwise we're just sticking a diagnostic or a label and it could just be very situational, right? It's not, not something that's going to last for longer than six months or a year. So be very, very um, mindful when, when diagnosing. Um, and then when you have your reactive or your disinhibited social engagement, keep in mind too, like context, like what's the demographics? Like is, is this child a foster child, right? Um, or is this child living with parents and had something very traumatic happen to them? Right, so so we want to gather as much as information as we can prior to making a diagno a diagnosis, um, and that's pretty much it. If anybody has any questions um, about the lecture or um, in general with with the content or the course, you know, remember that I I do hold student office hours on Wednesdays at eight in the morning, and I know Dr. Lappin holds her office hours in the evenings. Um, so reach out, pop in any questions. We're happy to help. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you guys for listening and sticking, sticking by. Um, I know this was rather a short, uh, presentation, but there's not a lot of, um, there wasn't a lot of diagnoses to go through. So, um, pretty straightforward. And as you kind of caught on, they, they overlap each other in some way. Um, but anyway, have a good rest of your day and looking forward to reading your posts.